and very excited uh, to be the question asker, as I'm calling myself, of this series today. Um, it is my pleasure to uh, be presenting the Stories Women Carry, which is a six episode long series that will take place every Monday from this week, um, highlighting creative practice of African women on the continent. Uh, with me today, before I introduce our panelists, I just want to uh, highlight that this is actually the first series that the HowlRound Theatre Commons is hosting that has both Kenyan Sign Language and American Sign Language interpretation. Um, so thank you so much to Rory, who is here as our American Sign Language representative. And later on, Raphael, who will be switching out with her, who are both our Kenyan Sign Language interpreters. And without further ado, I want to also introduce our panelist for today, our first, um, first panelist for this series. Uh, now, this person, it's very hard to introduce this person and, and do it justice because a bio is not enough, a speech is not enough, and we could be sitting here for the whole hour and I'm just still talking about this person. Uh, but uh, I'd like to start off by saying, hi, Sitawa. Thank you for being here. Thank you for taking the time to uh, be one of our panelists for this series and for starting us off. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Karishma. I'm so, so thrilled to be here with you um, and with every, and welcome everybody who is on the team as well as any, everybody who uh, come, you know, comes to, to, to listen. Yeah, yeah. So folks, just to tell you a little bit about Sitawa, um, I first met Sitawa not even been two years, um, but it feels like no. we have ancestrally and generationally known each other since we were even <laughs> conceptions in our parents' minds. <laughs> um, ambassador Sitawa now, actually, is what we should be calling her. And Ambassador Sitawa, you'll be telling us about, about um, why we should be calling you Ambassador shortly. Uh, but uh, Sitawa, uh, aside from being a veteran artist within our Kenyan theater scene here, um, is a poet, a performer, a writer, a storyteller in all sense of the word. Um, and a fun fact about her is that she represented Kenya nationally and internationally in both uh, hockey and in tennis. So we have quite the multidisciplinary artist truly drawing from her cultural diplomacy work, her, her, her sports into her art. So it's very exciting to have you. And um, Again, as I said, no introduction will do you justice. So I'm just going to throw it off to you and tell us why we should be calling you ambassador today um, and okay. all the other wonderful things you've been up to. Great. So I, I have always wanted to be called ambassador. I've always wanted to be an ambassador of something. And finally, <laughs> last week I got the call um, from DocuBox, Judy Kibinge and Mudamba Mudamba asked me to be the ambassador for Good Pitch this year, which is happening on the 12th of uh, November. So in, in, a very, in, in 10 days time. And what Good Pitch does is that it um, creates a, a venue, um, an opportunity, an event that allows um, film, do documentary film producers, people who, who produce a, a documentary film, as uh, under the uh, DocuBox um, uh, process, and they get to pitch to an audience of a very diverse audience, um, and they get to pitch to ask for something, the other things that they may need. So they've gotten some seed money, they've produced a film, and then they get to ask for more money for the film, for example, or partnerships in, in some shape or form, um, because these are films, these are documentary films that are. Uh, um, intended to make a difference and to 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 really transform society, um, and and some of the you know the films are just extraordinary uh, this year. Um, one of them is looking is uh, Dead and Kimathi, uh, Kenya's uh, a freedom, a hero, whom we don't know where he is buried. So his daughter sets off to discover where he's buried, and uh, two two Kenyan women are. To making um, uh, the film about that. About uh, there's another one from South Sudan, which is uh, uh, Garang's daughter, who who uh, follows her mother, who who is a filmmaker, and she um, uh, the film is about following her mother as her mother becomes 
uh, politician. She's one of the vice presidents in uh, South Sudan. There's an Ethiopian film that is um, uh, about the Red Terror. Uh, a young woman goes back to look for her aunt's legacy who, who disappeared during the Red Terror when she was about 23. She joined the um, uh, 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 freedom and communist uh, uh, struggle and, and she disappeared. So this, this young woman, her niece, is going back to, to find her. So, so very diverse films and, and, and really exciting, yeah. Thank you, Ambassador. That's why I'm that. the Ambassador. It's very, yeah. that's <laughs> why you're the Ambassador. Yeah. The championing and really being a part of this community of, of new work creators, eh? Um, so I'm just going to stick with Ambassador because I love the sound of that, right? So Ambassador, tell us, um, you know, a lot of these stories that you've just spoken about uh, have this <laughs> um, have this moment of going back or going back to rediscover things. And I know from knowing you in our conversations that um, you have a very strong connection to, to your roots. Um, so tell us about the roots that make this tree that is Ambassador Sitawa. Who, who are you? Who are you as an artist? Where do you come from? What is your story? Um, you're, you're going to, uh, Karishma, can you just ask me that again? Because you, you, you went in and out, have, so I'm not ah, quite. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, now I it's said, clear. So what, is, what are the roots that make this tree that is Ambassador Sitawa? Who are you? What is your practice? What, are, what is your story? You know, I had such an interesting experience um, this morning. I went to uh, the funeral service of some very dear friends of mine. Um, their father passed away and I, I, I went to the service. And they were incredibly generous in that they gave us this incredible um, view into, into this, this amazing man's uh, life. And he comes from a similar community as I come from, which is in Western Kenya. And it was it was extraordinary to listen to this and 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 the parallels because my father passed away in 2017. And the parallels, I've known this man for many years since I was a child, but I didn't realize how much they had in common. Like how you know, with my father, how how similar they were, how proud they were of their roots. And so, you know, as a colonized uh, person, one of the things that has happened is that we've been disconnected. And, you know, many, many families have not really taken time to, re you know, connect their children um, and give them that legacy. And I was very fortunate in that I had a father who did that. He gave me my legacy. And I was listening and, and, and they was talking about a very similar. So my legacy on my father's side, um, you know, he's 10 gener he gave me 10 generations on his father's side, and then he gave me four on his mother's side. So I have, I have these people behind me and I have their names and I, you know, um, and then, and then, and then he, he was very much a storyteller, although, although this is not what he, he did for a living. Um, but he told me stories. He told us stories, his children's stories all the time about his life, about, you know, um, himself. And you, you listen to um, about the past, about various relatives, you know, important uh, moments in, in, in um, you know, uh, cultural moments, etc. And And I listened, when I sat and listened to him, I also got the storytelling technique. So he had an amazing storytelling technique. Um, and, and and of course you're imbibing this without even realizing you're imbibing it. And then I and then I I am of the generation that I'm um, on the on the I I had I had the I had the traditional society um, and traditional world um, or you know I was I was part of it or it was part of me um, even though I then went we then went became very westernized and you know with the education and everything but because my father and my mother were the first um, people to do well in their community. Um, they, then, they then became like a magnet and, and lots of people, they, they, they were very generous. So they, they supported, you know, the, the, the usual Kenya, you know, African story. So they supported lots of relatives. 
So we, our home was a hub where lots and lots of relatives would come, lots of people would come. And one of the things they brought was stories. So I, I was constantly told stories, traditional stories. Um, and I, I just feel so lucky that I just had, you know, constantly being told these stories. Um, and then, and then um, my parents were very, both of them were very, um, you know, very, very progressive. So they gave all of us children everything that we needed. And, you know, were very excited about our academic, you know, for them, uh, um, the academic was really important. And, and, and so, um, you know, I had, I had, you know, really great, uh, um, uh, I went to really great schools. And in those schools, there was so much, so many opportunities. So, um, you know, to find yourself, to, ex to try out new things, art and music and theater and sport. And, and interestingly enough, the sport was actually also my father's legacy to, to me, to us, to his family, to his kids, because he was very, very good academically and he was very, very good at sports. So when I started playing um, when I got interested in sports, you know, I had somebody who just supported me, you know, um, and and would and would and would give me the things that I needed to 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 um, you know make my you know to get to become as good as I needed to 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 become. Um, yeah, so so that is the that is a background a bit a little bit. Just a bit, but we'll dive more into that. Actually, I, you know, I find it really interesting, just so fascinating what you said about how people just came with their stories and your home became this sort of repository of space where you, your family, your friends, the people that your parents were hosting yeah. came and just shared this gift of a story with you. Um, how did that influence the, the kind of artist you are today? You know, can you tell us a little bit about uh, some of the work that um, you I have been making? some of the work you make and how that um, influenced, if at all, your, your practice? Absolutely. I mean, um, I, I really was lucky. It was happening. I wasn't aware that it was happening, and I, but I was clearly imbibing it. So one of the things that, that um, when I set off and became a writer, a poet, a playwright, I had um, this repository of stories and then, and I also had technique with me. So um, one of the things, one of the things that I have always been interested in is the whole decolonizing. You know, you're, I, I remember sitting in, in, in history classes and absolutely hating history because the history, we were, we're sitting in there and, and, the, and the, the history teacher says, you know, speak discovered this and Livingstone did that, discovered the other and Grant and whoever. And I'd sit there and I'd think, if I accept what they're saying, it negates me, you know? Were my, my relatives walking around with their eyes closed? You know, why are they talking about these foreigners coming and, and discovering these things, right? So um, the, 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 the stories then also acted like a buffer. Um, so then when I, when I started to, to be really interested in decolonizing, you know, and, and, you know, making sense, you know, like reading Googie with Yongo, um, decolonizing the mind was wonderful because I, I was like, oh, this is what's happening to me. Um, you know, I understood so much. Uh, I, I, I had this buffer and I also had technique that I didn't even realize I had. So now my job, my job is to constantly remove this Western, you know, the, these lenses and, and this system that, have, that we have been um, immersed in and, and, and go back. And it's a, it's a, it's a process. It's, not, it's like peeling an onion. So you, you remove one so that another next layer, it's become the, it is, becomes possible to remove the next layer. And then it becomes possible to remove the next layer. Right. So you're, this is one of the things that I'm constantly doing. So if, if you look at some of my earlier poems, they were much more in the Western tradition and they're very like, you know, you can see my hands. They're very they're, they're much more in a box. And, and now the work that I do is much freer, you know, so so some of my latest work, for example, is, um, you know, ha, you know, after about 14 years now, I've been doing this for 14 years. Um, is now is now much more uh, it's much closer to to uh, our traditions 
So that there's a lot of flow and the, uh, the rhythm and the music is, in, is, is, is greater. Um, there's, a, there's, there's an interesting link to nature, you know, which I find, I find very interesting that there is a, there's an, a greater link to nature you know, so so some of the, the work that I've done um, recently, for example, uh, uh, from taking it's called one of the pieces called taking my father home and 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 it's told from a perspective of rivers, uh, you know, a very specific river that that, that talks and, the, and and you can just see the nature all around telling telling the story, even telling the story about me playing tennis, but it's nature, you know, that that that, that is imbued, you know, and, and, and that speaks. And it's and it's a process. I mean, I'm 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 excited to continue working on myself and removing again the layers and seeing what will what will I look like? What will my work look like in in um in, in two years' time? Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, there's a very interesting thing when when I'm experiencing your work or when I'm watching you speak or uh, when I when I've you know had these conversations with you that what I find fascinating is it's not just in the work but also in your process and also in your technique. There's this sort of stripping right. down, the peeling of the onion that that, that is yeah. manifesting, you know, in its in its own way, shape, and form. Could you speak a little bit more right. about? what the stripping down of the technique of making work looks like for you? Um, I'm curious, I mean, yes, the product, and you know, we'll get to see it later, but it, I'm, cu I'm curious how your practice or your process is non-Western. Okay. I'm, I'm very fortunate that um, I've had people write about my process because you know, you're just, I'm just in the process doing whatever it is that I'm doing. And it really helps when other people say, oh, this is what you're doing. So one of the things that uh, I learned when I started to write is I have a very collaborative way of, of working. And if I write a poem, and you, Karishma, I think can attest to this, I may call somebody and, and, and I will <laughs> share it and I'm and I'm I'm sharing it because when it bounces off another human being, even when they're not physically present, I can hear it. I can hear what's working or not working. I can, it's like music. I can hear the, the the wrong notes. I can I I can hear it. And so I actually need that. That's one of the things. So you know, individual pieces. This is this is one of the things that I do. I think another thing is. Um, that the, the practice, that the, the product is as important as the process to produce the product. So when I when I I'm, when I write um, when I'm writing something specific, it's it's coming out of, of a, a new layer. So I've taken off a layer, and and that layer then makes that kind of work possible, the new kind of work possible, um, and so and so. I know that working with with them um, when when I did my first production, cut off my tongue, um, I automatically set off, got a cast, and then everybody in the cast created with me. I wrote the 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 the, the, the poetry. I wrote the show, but each piece was was taken and owned, and and transformed by individuals, not necessarily in the writing. In the interpretation, in you know, in the performance itself. So, so there was a lot of um, collaboration. There was a lot of um, discussion, you know. Uh, and 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 one of the things that uh, somebody said to me is, "But my process is very horizontal. So I'm not the boss. Yeah, you you mm -hmm. are part. Everybody is part of the process. Opinions, every opinion. I want your opinion. I know what I know." You know, I know I, you wrote, you, you know what I know. I wrote it down. I, you know, so, you know, this is what I think about something, but I want to know what is it you think and, and what, what can, what can I take from what you think and, and add it onto, onto what I think and then create um, a much more complex mm -hmm. and, and truer representation of what, of what the world is. So I think another thing that um, one of the people said um, and, and that I I I, um, I I also agree with is that I embrace complexity. So I'm not I'm not expecting um, easy answers or 
or writing pieces that are, you know, just just see one side of an issue. I am I I do I do want uh, complexity, and sometimes you can sometimes there's a sentence that 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 can be heard understood in several ways, and and I really love that 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 and sometimes it works. A sentence can work with one above it to create one understanding and then the one below it to create another understanding. So very layered, very complex, but not, not confusing and not, not, um, not, not incomprehensible. You know, the, the, the idea of poetry, the, the, which I love as well. I mean, I love all, all forms of poetry. And, and sometimes people say, oh, we can't understand it. People can understand my work. I want you to understand it. But I also want you to to understand the layers, and and um, and not not to go away thinking um, she's going to give. I'm not going to give you the answers. You know, I'm not interested in the answers. You, everybody around, has got the answers that fit their life and their understanding, and wh wh whatever they're dealing with at the moment. So. Um, Working, you know, so so a lot of my work is, as I said, begins with me, and where I where I am at the moment, and that taking off that layer allows another way of seeing, another insight that you cannot you cannot get if you are, you know, when I was, you know, sixteen, I, you know, I wouldn't have had the insight that I am now, uh, that I have now. I'm much older. I I've seen much more in life. You know, so I'm constantly bringing myself to the table mm. as well as a work of and, art. Right. And you are a work of art in every sense of the word. Right. <laughs> I mean, uh, just for the folks listening in the first time, I mean, a few days ago when Sitao and I were having a conversation, I said to her, her very existence, like with the, the way she dresses up is a work of art. All Sitawa has to do is walk out of her house and that is art. Um, and, and, and for those that know her personally and have tuned in, know that, understand that feeling of like, yes, the Sitawa, the ambassador Sitawa the third Namwalia has walked out of her room and art is being made. <laughs> and, and not only her, but she brings the spirits of her entire family, her entire ancestry with her which I find very, very, very interesting, not only in the technique and the process, but also in the work. Um, Satawa, what topics interest you? What, what, I mean, you know, you've already started telling me about uh, taking my father home. I know about Room of Lost Names. There's What topics do you like writing about? Or do you like performing or presenting about? And why? Okay. Um... I have written a lot of a poetry around many many issues, and it depends on it depends on what is happening, you know, in the moment. I I'm constantly listening and you know for stories, um, and for you know things that things that touch me. So mm -hmm. you know, taking my father home, I started to write in 2017 when my father passed away. Um, he, he and I were very close and, you know, he just gave me so much. And, and so I started to watch this as I, as I, as we journeyed home. And so what, what we do in my community, um, we spent, first of all, if you, when you pass away, we spend in, in peacetime when there's no COVID, uh, there's two weeks of planning, you know, the people come together, you 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 know, we, somebody, somebody said, somebody a person buries themselves and that is so true so you people come you know to to support you and they contribute money they contribute IT ideas they contribute time um and we we you know like we'll have a budget and we raised whatever we needed to raise and then we then we set off now and went um for the actual burial and as we set off i started to write um and it was just so fascinating for me um, being in, in, in a position in which your cult, the culture is very alive because normal, normal times, you know, you, if you come to my house, you think, you know, I could be in New York, I could be anywhere. But when we have weddings and when we have funerals, when we have birth, a birth of children, um, that is when we, the culture becomes alive. And so we're living this culture and all sorts of incredible things were happening. 
um, there was a there was a point during the day of the the, the funeral where where some of my male male cousins came to me and said they're going to stop the funeral because my father died in the house and we have to we have to pay a fine and you know it was very 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 dramatic and if you'd seen me you'd you'd have thought oh my goodness she's so upset and you know so I I sort of played along <laughs> and then <laughs> it, it it got resolved yeah. you know and then all sorts of other things happened and you know so I'm watching this and it's like it's like it was a feast as a writer it was a feast so then I yeah. I set off to, to write about it to write, you know, to capture some of that. And I'm also, I was also capturing it because um, there is this sense that uh, these funeral uh, practices are backward. Um, we shouldn't do that, or they waste money, you know, they're, because, we, you know, we feed people thousands, of, you know, you can get a, a thousand people, you can get, you know, 500 people. And then, and then you have to feed them. And we did, we you got, got lots of people and, you know, cause my father was a prominent person in the community and in Kenya. And so we, we did, we fed them, um, but when you don't do it by yourself, your community is actually coming and, and, and supporting you. And I, mm -hmm. I, want, I wanted people to understand that this is, this is a valuable, valuable culture. These are val valuable cultural practices and we need to, you know, reconcile ourselves with them and you know, go back to understanding what are we doing? What are they? What is the purpose of these of these many steps that we we take? And and if you're talking about uh, a waste of money, um, why do people go to 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 watch movies or drink? You know, go and and eat out and alcohol, etc. You know, there's so many ways in which we allegedly waste money, and we know we're not, right? So this is for me. So right. these are some of the, the the cultural practices that I would like protected that we need to protect. Um, and 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 understand and understand that we have a mourning process that is not you don't have to when I hear about what happens in the West that a person dies and then their the families are left alone I think how sad because mm -hmm. the family comes together your friends come together you know and and you're not alone and and there are people to hold you so mm -hmm. so you know that's one of the things I mean I'm I'm I've one of my one of the other pieces that I'm, I've, I've just recently written is um, uh, Kimpa Vita discovering a, a, an incredible Congolese woman, incredible, who was born in 1684 and burnt at the stake by the Catholic Church in Congo at age 22 because she told them that she could see she had visions and she could see black saints. Um, walking hand in hand with white saints in paradise in before God. And they were like, what? Not possible. Mm. Among other things, she, you know, she, she was just an extraordinary, extraordinary woman. And, I, and I'm going to say it again, Kimpa Vita, um, Google her. I don't need to tell you uh, just <laughs> extraordinary people that we have on this continent. Yeah. Mm. Thanks, Satawa. Thanks. I, you know, what you just said about funerals and marriages and the birth of children, what we'd call a harambe here, like this coming together of community, whether it's for fundraising or whether it's, you know, to celebrate something or mourn a death, to me sounds very much like the experience of what we would call going to the theater, right? Uh, you know, what you've ex uh, explained is the idea of the West coming in and having a different understanding of what theater looks like is so different from the way the performance exists within these ritual yes. practices. Yes. Right. And, and then a play comes out of it. But the performance itself right. is, is that sense of community, is that way of life, is that preservation of that ritual tradition. Right. Um, how do you navigate, right. you know, the balance then? Um, because, you know, you have performed extensively across the country, but you're also an internationally acclaimed performer. How do you navigate the balance between... on stage so and you'll understand have to the that ritual again. practice or rituality around Karishma. what is being presented. Karishma, Hi. Just say that again. <laughs> okay, we're in Sorry. the in the tech. Because, yeah. No problem. Just go ahead again. No problem. There's a part of me that's yeah. like we're both we're, we're both in Nairobi. We should be doing this in the same room, I think. <laughs> um, but here's to technology. You Thank know, you. I, next time. Yeah. Next time. Yeah. Next time. Thank you to uh, everybody for bearing mm -hmm. with us. 
I'm just going to take a breath here so we can have, um, make sure we're all on the same page with technology. And I will ask my question now. Um, what I was asking okay. was how you navigate, given that you have performed internationally and extensively in the region as well, mm. um, how do you navigate performing pieces that are understood as ritual practice in some parts of the world, but not necessarily in the same way in others? Um, what has the audience response been? How have you um, made it more relevant to the audiences, if at all? Have you, I guess? Right. Okay. Um, okay, so first of all, I don't think about an audience. Mm. I, I actually don't think about an audience. Because <laughs> who, if, if I was going to think about an audience, who would I be thinking about? Which one? Mm -hmm. um, what I, what I, but I do, I, but I have explored. I remember when I did Cut Off My Tongue and, I, and we were getting incredible responses in Kenya, and then we went to the UK and in, in four places, performed in four places, including the Hay Festival. And at the, at the Hay Festival, most of the people who came were elderly uh, Welsh people, you know? And they were responding <laughs> in the same way as, as the Kenyans. And then, and then in Kenya, we performed it in a Langata Women Prison and Muthega Club, two polar opposites. And they were mm. responding like there's a place there's a there's one particular poem where I remember we said, um, uh, Mawing, you know, 500 kilometers on the Mawingo night bus, and everybody laughed. I almost wanted to say, hold on, hold on, why are you laughing? Why are you laughing? You know, what, what, <laughs> you, what, you don't know what is the Mawingo night bus? Why are you laughing? Okay, um, mm. and I think I think the thing I've understood is, tell your truth, your truth. If you tell your truth. It is a human truth and it connects ev to everybody. So um, I've got a poem called, We Leave Our House to Go, a long narrative poem called, We Leave Our House to Go Home. And I remember um, when I set off to write it, it was about the experience of, in, in, okay, just for the, the non-Kenyans, in Kenya, we have a home and we have a house. So Nairobi, where I live right now, this is my home. But where I come from, I mean, it's my house, but where I come from, right? So where, where my, you know, my ancestors come from, where my, when, when we were children, we'd go back there and that is the home, right? So we leave our house to go home and it's a whole journey. And it was an, you know, when I was a child, we, we, it was seven, kilom seven um, hours away, seven, eight hours away. They claimed it was seven, eight, but I think sometimes it was like 10 hours away, <laughs> you know, difficult and we're, you know, when, when we first went, you know, we'd lived in Nairobi for honestly just a few years. Um, I think we first went from, from Nairobi when I was eight or nine and we're, we're squeezed in a VW Beetle. There's five of us, five of us children and then a mom and a dad and a cousin maid. And then there's the luggage, you know, cause we also used to take all our food with us. And we're tr traveling across the country to the Western part of Kenya near the Uganda border. And we've got, we get punctures on the way and we are hungry and we are tired and we're squashed. And, and, <laughs> and it was an incredible, and, and then we arrived in, in this place and, you know, these strange relative people who they told us were our relatives, you know, and, and um, cause it doesn't take long to forget, particularly if you're a child to become used to something totally different. And, 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 and they're so happy to see us and, and I remember them asking that ask this irritating question. I can't tell you how irritated I used to get. Do you know me? And sometimes somebody would say, Do you know woman in my language? Woman. Do you know me? I, I held you when my eyes, when your eyes were closed. Do you know me? <laughs> I'm like, well, you just told me that my eyes were closed. How would I know you? Right? So <laughs> And, and, my, and, then, and then there's a way in which, the traditional way in which they shake hands, you know, and, and, and they shake hands like this, and then they say this long thing, swa, 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 te, 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 no, 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 you know, they're going on and on. And I remember at some stage, my brothers would be like, mom, dad, tell them to stop, my hand is tired. <laughs> so Nairobi <laughs> Britishness. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so that poem, 
listen to listen to how specific it is to me and then i perform it and 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 shock everybody gets it everybody gets it because it's actually about dislocation and we're mm. all your childhood is not who you are today even if you stayed in the same place that childhood is not what what does not the present doesn't look anything like your childhood right mm. and then many of us have moved what is home you go back and it's home is looking at you like you're you're a weirdo and we were really weird you know we were a source of constant amusement people would laugh at us all the time at the things we didn't know we didn't you know i didn't we didn't know how to carry water on our heads anymore where where i come from you carry your heads on uh, uh, a, a large very heavy pot on your head and you go down hills and you climb back up hills with a water you know full of water and and by the time we'd arrive home we'd be wet and they would just be rolling on the, on the ground laughing <laughs> <laughs> you know so i think i think if you you know like if if you think about it i mean i i read i when i was growing up you know the other thing that i did uh, that i was very fortunate that when i was growing up i read a lot you know i um mm. uh, again my father was a reader so everybody in our family we just read and i got i got a serious uh, i became a serious addict and so i'm reading lots and lots and lots of stuff and um, you know, I was reading uh, Indian uh, stories and Chinese and British and American and you know, no, we, from everywhere. And if 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 the if the, the story that the, the, if the person who the writer told their truth, it didn't matter that I've never that I don't know I've never seen I've never been to China, I would get it. And I think mm. that's the same thing. Yeah. Mm. Beautiful. Thank you, Sitawa. I mean, yeah, the minute you started speaking about the, the idea of displacement, you know, I, there's so much happening right now in the world where right. that specific poem, which not, didn't necessarily come from that space, could speak to refugee crisis, for example, or the immigrant crisis, or so right. many other things mm -hmm. that are happening within our various contexts. Right. Um, you also started, you know, this, I guess, will be my last question before we move into our little gift presentation moment. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're speaking a lot about your father and also about how you're an avid reader and these other influences in your life that have shaped you as an artist. Could you speak a little bit more about who you are as a sportswoman and as an, ad, uh, as an ambassador and a cultural diplomat and all of these other, these other hats that you wear? How do they influence you as an artist, as a maker? Okay. Okay. So um, um, I am, I'll just talk about, first of all, being a, an environmentalist and working in development. So mm. I'm an environmentalist. And uh, when I was 14, I, I have very many epiphanies. Okay. <laughs> so when I was 14, I'm, <laughs> I'm sitting in class and the teacher starts talking about the environment. And I was like, oh, this is it. This thing that she, this woman has just said is it. I'm going to become an environmentalist. And over the years, somehow, I managed to, to, to maintain interest. And I actually went to the US to study environmental, uh, to do an, a, a master's degree in environmental studies. You know, I got a scholarship to, to do a, a degree in environmental studies. Um, you know, I, I, I can't, I sometimes can't believe Amazing. it, but it's true, I did. And, and I worked in it for several years and, and, and it was, it was, uh, it was, it really was amazing. And it was very, very um, satisfying um, working, particularly working with communities. I was working with the, with the United Nations, with working with communities, um, getting them to, um, to, to use and manage their, their, their natural resources so that they could uh, meet their own needs. You know, mm. so you know, school fees and 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 so forth. So I had a whole range of different types of projects that um, I, I I supported. Um, you know, from water projects around the country to uh, biogas. You know, and you know, energy projects, biogas and livestock projects, and um, uh, one of I think some of the most uh, amazing, but the butterfly project at the coast, the Kipepeo project at the coast, which you may know. Um, is one mm -hmm. of the ones I supported. Um, wow. uh, organic farming, organic farming was was uh, one of the one of my favorite. Really, really incredible. So um, just 
a whole range. Um, in Pocotland, I remember supporting the Pocot farmers to reestablish uh, a, a, an indigenous system of taking water from down in a valley and bringing it right up on onto a hill, and you know, to to uh, irrigate their 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 crops. You know, so you know, just an, an incredible experience. Um, however, one of the one of the things that uh, pushed me towards becoming an artist. Or becoming a poet. Well, first of all, it was because it was my dream from when I was a child, um, which I didn't really think I could do. Um, and but then, as I as I continued working in in in, uh, in development, in environment, in uh, uh, governance issues, women's rights issues, etc., uh, human rights issues, I I I began to see that our problem was in our minds. What what you think is what you create, and I, I began to see that we were adept at, at recreating poverty because mm. the ideas that we had about ourselves, our colonial legacy, and then the, you know, then, you know, post-colonial and all the, all the stuff that has happened to us means that we um, very often recreate something negative rather than something positive. And, mm. and, and then I thought, well, I'm going after the mind. So here I am. I'm after, I'm after your minds. <laughs> yeah. Um, if it if it comes to when it comes to sports, uh, that's one of the things I really loved. And it, and and as I reflect on that, it was so interesting because I I went to a particular school, um, and I wasn't very good at sports in that school. Everybody was much better than me. And then I had this experience where I my my mom my mother moved us unceremoniously to a new school. And the school was was full of mzungus, and we were mm. very very few Africans. And they and I arrived in the school, and they tried they put me somewhere, and I interpreted it as they're relegating me. And I mm. I sat there in that school, and I said and I said to myself, you will see. And the school was very very good at sports and very good academically. And within a term, I was on the hockey team. I was on the tennis team. And I, I, you know, when I think about it now, I was like, what happened? I don't what? know what happened, <laughs> but I felt exactly. I, I just, I just thought I, because I, I, I suppose the incentive, because I thought I was being re relegated to a nonsense, to a nothing, you know, like they're putting me in the garbage. I, I just, I rebelled. I was like, forget it. You, you're not going to do that to me. Watch this space. And mm. I, I think it was, I mean, I, I loved, absolutely loved, loved sports. I mean, I think it saved me in terms of um, um, ac even academically. Um, my parents would tell me if I didn't do well in school, in my academics, they would stop me from playing sports. <laughs> so, oh, wow. So that, you, know, <laughs> you know, so, you know, well, that there we have it, a serious incentive. And and just and, and 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 you know the two sports are very different. So hockey is very physical. You know, um, you know, you run, you, 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 you know, you you just it's very it's a very, much more freer kind of sport. And whereas tennis is gets very intellectual and you know strategic and whatever. And also hockey is very dangerous. And that's one of the things mm. I loved about it. I love that it was so dangerous. Which mm -hmm. I don't know what it says about me, but you know, I'm sure it says a lot. You're a dangerous um, woman, Sitao. You You're learn... a dangerous woman. <laughs> <laughs> and then it, and then you learn how to. I mean, I hardly ever, ever got into trouble. I hardly ever got uh, hit, or because you learn how to. You, you're playing with danger, so you learn how to evade it. Mm. And the only times that I did get into into problems was when we we went. You know, like my school. Um, and my team um, a couple of times won the national, the Nairobi uh, League, and we then went to represent Nairobi in the national national uh, sports competition. And the other kids hated us because we came, you know, we were incredibly <laughs> elite. You know, we spoke English, you know, the way I speak English. And, and, and so, you know, we were just like, they just, everybody just hated us and they would go for us. And so, you know, there, there are times when I'd have, horns because the ball had hit me or a stick had hit me you know or whatever um and and the, you know there's a there was a time when i ha we had we actually quit we're like 
this is too dangerous, we're leaving. Um, wow. The t tennis was much more, yeah, you know, it, you know that that's life. I I, I lived here. I am. Um, <laughs> tennis, here you are telling your story. Tennis was yep. much. Here I am telling the story, and then tennis was much much more. Um, uh, you know, it it allowed a lot of travel. So I ended up traveling a lot. Um, when I was from when I was pretty young, out of Kenya, um, within Kenya, out of Kenya, and um, but both of them, one of the the things that was happening for us because I was among the first generation, we were literally decolonizing um, the sport and getting mm. a lot of, so we got a lot of flack, um, a lot of resistance. So we're, we're in white spaces where, you know, these were white sports in Kenya and there we are um, and, and, you know, little kids, you know, I got called monkey when I was a, you know, I, when I was a child in Kenya, I didn't have to leave anywhere to be called monkey by these little white kids. At, at a certain club, which I shan't mention, um, <laughs> you know, and then and, and and then and then our parents weren't like the the, the the Mzungu parents; they weren't there. So we were on our own, you know, battling these battles. I I don't even think I I hardly ever told my parents I, during the time it was happening. I never told them anything. I never told them a, a single thing about the experiences I was going through. Um, it stuff stuff just happened, and you had to deal with it. And so right. you know, you you'd get you know, unfair judgments and you, you, you know, you'd be by yourself on the court and all the other kids and their parents and the organizers are white and, and the ball is being called out when you can see it's in. And you just, you just, it's amazing now when I think about it, we just like, okay, we talk yeah. about, our, about it among ourselves. Like, you know, that is really unfair. No, 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 no. I actually won, but you didn't, you didn't make a fuss and you just, okay, this is it. And then it's you, done, and then you yeah. come back and say, next time I'm beating you. And you're gonna you're gonna have to make sure that the it's really hard for them to do that to you, you mm. know. And in the end, it was. Mm. Mm. Yeah. You're a dangerous woman, and it taught you how to fight. And it's it's <laughs> what you are today, it and it's very clear, right? Like there are so many experiences beyond your art that have made you the artist that you are, um, in every this sense of true. the word. Mm. Yeah. Sp absolutely. Speaking about your artistry, you know, Satawa, I, this mm -hmm. is my most I've been waiting for this for a while now, but uh, just to share with our audiences, Satawa uh -huh. has something um, special prepared for us that she'd like to share. So um, as I mentioned, it'll be my last sort of question and I, I want to hand it over to you to, to give us the gift that is your work, Satawa. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, so give me a moment. Take your time. Mm -hmm. I had it all set up. Oh, there it That's is. Okay, yeah, it is set up. I was looking at, at the wrong script. So <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to um, share with you uh, an excerpt from Taking My Father Home, and some of it I've performed, but. Some of it I haven't. So, so I'm, I reworked, I've been reworking the script. And so um, uh, I'm, I'm going to share this with you. And I just want to mention that it's, it's just a part of it. So let me tell you about River Lusumu. Um, where I come from in Western Kenya, there's a river, River Lusumu, which is um, uh, used to be an incredible, incredibly huge river. It still is um, and incredibly significant uh, uh, for me and my people, the Banyala, uh, the Banyala Bandombi, Abanyala Bandombi. And um, one of the things that happened was that as we migrated from the West, from you know, Uganda and came and ended up coming into Kenya, we used to live in, in forests. And for some reason, the Kabaka wanted us out of the forest and we wouldn't get out of the forest. So he sent an army. And they, they, they say uh, something I, I read um, that was recorded of that time, that the river, that the, the, the Banyala were killed in such numbers that River Lusumu was red with the, the, the blood of the Banyala. So that's just a little snippet from, a his, from history, many, many, you know, in the 19th century. So taking my father home. 
River Lusumu squeezes herself into a narrow channel. She becomes a thin ribbon of water, and I hear her complaining and fighting to get past the rocks in her way. She stops her struggle to speak to me. You have done well. You have done well to bring your father home. Not everyone does the right thing. The sun glints off her surface. Her voice whispers with relief. He's back home. You have done well. He's been gone for years, building a life on airplanes, in boardrooms, chairing meetings, advising governments, building institutions, leading the way. She continues in a low whisper. I have to strain to hear. Your father was the beginning of things. When you are the beginning of things, where do you find the scent of a trail to lead you? When you're the beginning of things, to whom do you confide when your new life staggers? When you are the beginning of things, how do you make your way back home? River Lusumu turns into a bow lake, spreads herself into a vast marsh, only to reappear again as a rhythmic waterfall, thundering over a steep cliff into an endless gorge. I am taking my father home. A daughter's loss. I know you pay the price sometimes for your father's success. I look up to find River Lusumo cradling my old sorrows in a warm, soft voice. She continues. You remember the many times your father was absent at crucial moments in your life? I remember. I nod, too scared to speak in case the heartache of so many years ago breaks through. I remember. He wasn't home for my O-levels. He wasn't home for my A-levels either. I remained silent in fear of betraying my father's memory. River Lusumu has no such worries and continues to speak quite freely. Let's go to your tennis career. Remember how your dream began to soar and you became the girl to beat? I smile and remember as memories of one tennis match after another slide past, stopping every so often at a special momentous match. River Lusumu continues with my memories. And then that one match. You are up. Six love, four one. Remember? I remember. I was winning. You made the mistake of moving on before you had finished the job, before the final ball had flown past your opponent. I remember. River Lusumu shouts. Her words admonish me for the, this long ago slip up. Your mind swaggered. It cast itself in the guise of a winner, did it not? At just six love, four one. Ripples interrupt the smooth flow of the river. 40-15, game, 4-2. It's okay, you're still ahead and you're serving. Your mind was dismissive and self-assured, wasn't it? Deuce, advantage you. Your smug mind actually smirked. <sighs> river Lusumu sighs knowing all too well what is to follow. I remember, Deuce, advantage her. Game, 4-3. Whispers broadcast your imminent fall and a gloating crowd gathers. I remember. Just like that, with no warning at all, the crowd signaled, I was no longer there, darling. I was yesterday's news. They demanded a fresh new champion. I bristled with resistance. Only Rivalisum was on my side. Deuce, advantage you. You stared down that crowd. One girl versus many eyes demanding her fall. I remember. Deuce, advantage her. Game for all. I remember. I remember. The crowd jumps up, unleashing noisy ecstasy and gobbling up all my confidence. It was in that moment that I discovered what it is to choke. I am choking. Rigor mortis sets in and my body loses its natural flow. Remember, River Lusumo finishes the story. In the last set, your arms rebelled. They refused to take orders from your derelict mind. There was a brief moment when you won two games in a row and the hostile crowd, crowd growled. The final point rode past you. 
the crowd erupted in celebration. In that moment, my eyes reached out in search of my father, only to find myself alone in a world full of enemies reveling in my fall. I remember, I remember. River Lusumu flows so smoothly, she almost stands still. I am taking my father home. And now he's back home. The river is ecstatic. She bounces on pebbles with glee. The river goes into reflection, whirling and dredging up old memories, gathering streams, brooks, and rivulets of memory. The river sighs in relief. He is home. Now listen to the tributes flowing, flowing, pouring, filling every pot, overflowing every vessel. When he left, he looked just like these villagers come to mourn him. There he is, a two-year-old boy, looking at life through wide open eyes. Then he becomes that child of six, herding cows and sheep with casual ease. River Lusumu whispers a secret. In his herd, there is a big black and white bull with long horns and a filthy temper. But the bull is no match for your father and his seasoned expertise. The river laughs at this runaway memory. There, look there. I look and I see a thin young boy of 15 standing in the distance, anchored to the ground by all, only the all-knowing confidence of a teenager. The river has already moved on and is now pointing out the new young man about to stride out into the world in a borrowed jacket, patched trousers, worn and ironed to a shine. For all these my father wants, I am taking my father home. I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Satawa. There's no better way for us to call it a wrap um, here, just leaving us with so many questions and so much. So much to take away and, and think about. Uh, I'm lost for words myself, as you can see. So I uh, <laughs> thank you, thank you very much, Satawa. Thank um, you. I, you know, yeah. I just want to also thank uh, Rory and Raphael and Lucy. Thank you so much for um, being, you know, here and um, communicating the story using different words and different language with um, our other, you know, our audience members. Um, thank you so much to the HowlRound Commons for hosting us on the series and to the Nairobi Musical Theatre Initiative and the Tebere Arts Foundation as well for, for being co-producers. Co um, and Satawa, just thank you for the gift uh, that you are for us, the young ones on um, you. and old ones and everybody here in Kenya. And I hope that, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, maybe no maybe if you can just share with us what is the best way to to follow your work um, so that our other audience members and listeners can can follow you. Mm. Let us know. And OK. OK, I'm, I mean, I'm on social media and um, uh, you can you can follow my work there. Um, this I've been doing quite a lot of work uh, online lately, which is which is a lot of fun, and um, I will have I will have other uh, new new initiatives quite soon. Yeah, um, I look forward to engaging with all of you and thank you everybody. Thank you for the whole team and such a great initiative. It's been an incredible. Thank you pleasure. so much. Thank you, Satawa. Um, and so we'll sign off here, but uh, feel free to tune in for our conversation next week. Um, it's the same time, same place, at the comfort of your couch. Uh, we have another wonderful panelist joining us next week. So I hope to see you all soon at 8 p.m. East Africa time. Uh, I believe that's 12 p.m. New York time and 9 p.m. California time. So see, it's 9 a.m. California time, sorry. See you all then. <laughs> okay, take care, bye.